Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is there is a backstory, a story behind the story of Saudi Arabia's gathering of 34 countries to form a coalition to fight ISIS. The first item to note is that while 33 countries came to Riyadh, they were all Muslim, they were not all Arab. Next, we must pay attention to those who were not invited. Saudi Arabia chose to invite Lebanon and the Palestinian Authority. They did not invite Iran, Hamas, or Iraq. Pakistan saw that they were on the list, but they did not attend. And all this is a clue to the purpose and the vision of the Saudi-inspired and Saudi-led group. ISIS is the flavor of the month when it comes to a cause worth fighting now. In this case, it is also the cloak covering the raison d'etre behind Saudi Arabia's decision to form this group. The coalition was set up to hamper and destroy Iranian hegemony. The bonus is that in the process it will also hurt not only ISIS, but also Syria's Assad, Russia, Hezbollah, Iraq, and the United States of America. It will also weaken and attack Shiite powers of all stripes and any Sunni force that is trying to unseat what the Saudis deem to be moderate Sunni Western friendly leaders. It's all part of a master plan that Saudi Arabia has created and now put into action. ISIS is where the plan begins. It ends after Saudi Arabia has reached its goal of hurting Iran, the Shiites, and those who help the Shiites. Saudi Arabia is not just looking for a little wince signifying pain. They are looking for a big ouch. The Saudis have given up on the United States. The final nail in the coffin of the United States and Saudi relations came when the United States signed the nuclear deal, thereby bringing Iran back into the community of nations and even permitting them nuclear status in 15 years. That was for the Saudis a massive insult and a deadly move. With that deal, the United States both empowered and emboldened the mortal enemy of Saudi Arabia. And the United States did not even realize the ramifications of their actions. Saudi Arabia wants to hurt Russia because, like Iran, Russians are propping up President Bashar Assad of Syria. And Assad is an Alawite, and the Alawites are an offshoot of Shiite Islam. The balance in the region is slowly shifting, and Saudi Arabia is taking it back. Look what Saudi Arabia has already done. They're supporting Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, against the Muslim Brotherhood. And they have lured the Sudanese leader away from Iran. In severing ties with Iran, the Sudanese have eliminated an important Iranian weapons conduit and trade route, a route that they used to transfer much needed arms to Hamas in Gaza and the Assad-friendly forces in Syria, as well as Hezbollah. The Saudis know better than to, milita than to militarily tangle with the United States and Russia in Syria. They will steer clear of Russian and United States forces on the ground and in the air. Instead, the Saudis will hurt them where it hurts most, in their pocketbook. At the last OPEC meeting in November, Saudi Arabia convinced everyone to keep oil production levels stable. They did it despite the free fall on the price of oil. Since June, oil has fallen 40 percent, and it's now about $35 a barrel. Saudi Arabia is the largest producer of oil in OPEC and they will not change their limit per day barrel export. OPEC members had hoped to decrease production and increase price. They had hoped to apply the simple supply and demand curve. You remember that from Econ 101. Saudi Arabia nixed it because when they last tried to manipulate the market, their economy took a nosedive, and it took the Saudi empire 20 years to recover. Speaking from experience, they argued, their point and convinced OPEC members that staying the course allows them to plot the market more properly and accurately. The country that was most hurt by this play by Saudi Arabia was indeed Iran. The Iranians are trying to start their oil business and because the Saudi-inspired decision 
they will not reap the oil money they had hoped for. Iraq is also trying to gain. They're trying to gain more revenue, and they, too, need those funds. But Iraq has become a Shiite nation and has needlessly attacked Sunnis, and so the Saudi Arabians want to cause them pain and suffering. Next on the Saudi list is Russia, a very large producer of oil. The Russians are an even larger producer of oil than Saudi Arabia, and they really need the money because of sanctions placed against them after their Crimean land grab and the actions in Ukraine. Saudi Arabia wants to bring Russia to their knees. Although they were doing it inadvertently, the country that is most helping Saudi Arabia hurt the other oil-producing countries is China. Demand for oil in China has dropped. They're using less oil and replacing it with more energy-efficient systems and even alternative systems. But most importantly, as the Chinese economy has slowed down, so has their need for oil. And the United States is anything but unscathed by this action of the Saudi Arabians. The U.S. was bent on tapping into its own oil reserves. But private industry has either slowed, postponed, or in many cases completely scrapped their plans to produce oil and use U.S. oil. It's no longer worth the money. In the U.S., it costs between $50 to $70 to produce a barrel of oil. It costs Saudi Arabia $30 per barrel. The Saudis have begun to successfully remove competitors from the market itself. They have stopped the United States from entering the field. They are crippling their enemies, and they can withstand the drop in price, which they know will, of course, bounce back. This coalition of 34 is most certainly not simply about fighting ISIS. It's about Saudi Arabia taking up their position as a world leader. It's about Saudi Arabia showing the United States and Russia, and most importantly, Iran, that they have taken the role of leader of the Muslim world, and they are a serious force to contend with. Coming up, points of view. Here's what some important voices have been talking about. First up is a column posted on December 21st, 2015. This column comes from the Times of Israel. It's by Micha Odenheimer. The piece is called Burundi on the Brink. It's a Jewish issue. Micha Odenheimer is a journalist, rabbi, social entrepreneur who founded Tevel Betzedek, an Israeli organization doing development work and offering a Jewish platform for service learning with impoverished and marginalized communities in the developing world. Micha has written for numerous publications from Ethiopia, Somalia, Iraq, Burma, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. Odenheimer's objective is to have a positive impact on the world and to make it a better place. He's a personal friend. I know him for many years. And for the many years that I have known him, he's actually made a difference. This is how he starts. Quote, Burundi is a small African country, just about the size of Israel, that's in danger of descending into a maelstrom of violence and murder. Hundreds have already been shot to death in the capital city of Bajubara. Over these past few months, many of them this past weekend, more than 200,000 refugees, 2% of the population, have fled to the country of Tanzania, Rwanda, and the Congo. Burundi has the same ethnic makeup as Rwanda, where in 1994, at least 800,000 Tutsis were killed over a 100-day period. From 1994 to 2006, when the Arusha Peace Agreement was finally signed, 300,000 Burundians, both Hutu and Tutsi, were massacred in successive convulsions of violence. As the peace agreement unravels, the specter of mass killings that has haunted this generation of Burundians as they have tried to rebuild their country is fast becoming a nightmarish reality. Odenheimer is laying out the parallel between the Rwandan genocide and today. He tells us it's the same group of people, the Tutsis, being murdered again by the Houthis. Now Odenheimer presents the challenge. He says, we can learn from the past, from Rwanda. He does not raise the issue of the Holocaust, at least not yet. He writes, quote, and yet this descent into hatred and vengeance does not have to continue. Burundi 2015 is not Rwanda 1994. It is not clear if the politically sparked bloodshed in Burundi will deteriorate into full-fledged ethnic violence but we can learn the lesson from Rwanda. And what we know now 
in terrible hindsight, is that a little determination on the part of the United States during those crucial hundred days could have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Odenheimer is correct. A little effort on the part of the U.S. stopped the genocide. Imagine, this could be done now, too. This is how he puts it. Odenheimer says that what is happening in Burundi is a Jewish issue. Why? Because of the Holocaust. In Odenheimer's words, for Jews in the years after the Holocaust, the notion that the world would continue with business as usual while civilians were being slaughtered wholesale seemed intolerable. Perhaps this was a naive hope, because mass murders, genocides, politicides, spurred by various combinations of ideology, politics, economic, interests, religion, and ethnicity have proliferated since the end of World War II. The list is heartbreakingly long and geographically various. It includes Indonesia and Bangladesh, Cambodia and China, Rwanda and Congo, Kurdistan and Syria, Darfur and South Sudan, and more. Odenheimer concludes and says that the Jews of the United States must act to save lives. They must because they have the power to save lives, as they have in the past. Odenheimer writes, and yet on some of these occasions, for example in Darfur, the concerted outcry of many, including Jewish leaders, did make a difference. In the case of Burundi, genocidal massacres have already taken place, sometimes Hutu on Tutsis, sometimes Tutsis on Hutus. 30,000 here, 10,000 there, across a 30-year period. We are forewarned. A potential relapse under current conditions seems eminently possible. It behooves the United States Jewish community and its organizations to do everything in their power to make sure this relapse does not take place. Micha Odenheimer is correct, and the government and the organized Jewish community should step in, they should step forward and enable a plan to stop the massacres. It's the right thing to do, it's the moral thing to do, it's the Jewish thing to do. Second up is a column from the JTA, the Jewish Telegraph Agency, now part of 70 Faces. The column is penned by Jerry Silverman, the president and CEO of the JFNA, the Jewish Federations of North America. JFNA is the umbrella for the Jewish Federations of North America. Silverman is the professional leader. This column takes a serious stand on a hot-button issue, Jewish unity. Imagine, unity is a hot-button issue. How? Well, the column is called, Why I Take Personally Chief Rabbi's Criticism of Non-Orthodox School Visit. It appeared on December 13, 2015, in JTA. A little background is in order in order to understand this. Education Minister from Israel, Naftali Bennett, was in the United States during Hanukkah, and he visited a Jewish day school, the Solomon Schechter School of Manhattan, which is affiliated with the conservative movement of Judaism. The visit was covered in the Israeli press, and Bennett was deeply touched by the educational environment and their love of Israel. Also note that Bennett is also the Minister of Diaspora Affairs, an important point for this story. Israel's Ashkenazi chief rabbi, Rav David Lau, took Bennett to task and clearly said that going to that school embraced assimilation and values that will destroy Judaism and Israel. Jerry Silverman responded with this op-ed. He begins by saying that one need not agree, but civil discourse is essential. Quote, at the Jewish Federations of North America's General Assembly this year, it was made clear that a healthy Jewish community does not have to have unanimity on all issues, but we do need to be unified and, above all else, have civility in discourse. It was obvious this week that Israel's Ashkenazi chief rabbi, David Lau, missed the message. Silverman continues and quotes the following. It wasn't that long ago that Rav Lau met with Federation leaders and rabbinic leadership from across the denominations in JFNA's New York offices, calling himself, quote, your brother in Israel. The rabbi was extremely warm and welcoming. Given the frustration and anger that many non-Orthodox Jews feel when it comes to the myriad ways Israel's religious establishment treats them as second-class Jews, we took this visit as a positive step forward, unquote. I see it differently. Rav Lau said what he needed to say at the moment at the JFNA offices behind closed doors. 
but he needed to respond to Bennett's visit in public because it was made public. This is an example of the public-private issue. Lao cannot be seen as weak in the face of non-Orthodox Jews. While Bennett, also Orthodox, has a very different agenda. Bennett is interested in Kalal Yisrael, the totality of Israel, not a limited sliver. Bennett sees Israel as the most unifying feature of the Jewish world. Subscribing to that philosophy makes you a player in his eyes. That is what Bennett saw at the Solomon Schechter Conservative Day School in New York City. He saw love of Israel. Silverman continues. He quotes Rav Lau and his critique of Bennett. Quote, that is why it was so stunning and frustrating this week to see Rav Lau publicly criticize Education Minister Naftali Bennett for visiting the Salman Schechter School of Manhattan, a New York City day school affiliated with the conservative movement. Rav Lau said, you cannot go to a place where the education distances Jews not only from the tradition but also from the past and therefore from the future of the Jewish people. Rav Lau said, terming the visit unacceptable. As I see it, it boggles the mind. To see this kind of dispute in public, Rav Lau did not need to respond in public, but he did, and that caused even greater tensions between Israel and the Jewish community in the United States. Silverman writes, Bennett's interest in learning about Jewish education modalities was absolutely appropriate, and visiting a school that promotes Jewish education, Jewish learning, and Jewish living is in line with his ministerial responsibilities. We hope Israeli leaders follow his example of reaching out to all Jews wherever they are, including at religious schools, day schools, and camps affiliated with all Jewish streams. And here is how Silverman concludes. He says that leaders need to stop this critique of Jewish unity. He writes, Rav Lau should follow suit. He would see, as Bennett tweeted after his visit to the school, so much love of Israel and so much love of Judaism, unquote. Finally, he writes, we are hopeful that these comments criticizing leaders who believe in Am Echad, one people, will end and we will move toward unity and civility. As the head of JFNA, Silverman represents the concept of building bridges within the Jewish community. Part of his job forces him to face many who simply pay lip service to unity. Over the years, my experience has been that many call for unity, but actually, they're just asking us to behave just like them. They really aren't interested in unity. They're really interested in uniformity. That's a problem. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. Today, there are three cartoons I want to show you. All three come from the Tribune News Service. The first one is by Jack Oman and was published on December 16th. I saw it in the Sacramento Bee. Obama is on the U.S. tank, and he's dressed like Rambo, knife in mouth, bullets across his chest, throwing a hand grenade. In the background are two generals. One says, okay, we get it. You are serious about ISIS. This cartoon makes fun of Obama, who is constantly having to prove himself to the generals and to others about whether he's serious about confronting ISIS. This is one of the most persistent and significant critiques of President Obama over the last two years. The second cartoon is by David Horsey. It was published in the LA Times, December 14th. The cartoon has four panels. It's a dialogue between two Muslims, a modern dressed Muslim and a Muslim in black with his head covered, someone from ISIS. The modern Muslim, with his finger out, points at the ISIS man and says, it's a twisted version of Islam that you fanatics of ISIS believe in. The ISIS man responds, no, it's not. In the next panel, the modern Muslim says, we modern Muslims are the future of the faith. The ISIS man responds, no, you're not. In the next panel, the modern Muslim now shouts, pitiful, you can't win a religious argument just by saying no. The ISIS man says, no, with a question mark. In the last frame, the ISIS man takes out a large knife and says, then I'll win by chopping off your head. Horsey is stating the obvious but the obvious can be extremely funny. ISIS does not need to win a theological argument. They have the power of intimidation, what we call the fear factor. That's how they win and are winning the religious debate. The last cartoon is an ISIS man holding up a shopping list. 
All around him are weapons and armaments with labels saying made in and then fill in the blank. Tanks say made in America. Rockets say made in France. Guns say made in Russia. On the list, it reads Humvees, tanks, M16s, AK-47s, SAMs, RPGs. The ISIS guy says, I already have all the toys on my wish list. Yes, it is a play on the Christmas gift list. Unfortunately, ISIS has already been given all the military toys they need and all the military toys they want, whether they took them or they were delivered, or if they picked them up after the others ran away and abandoned them, or maybe even they were aerial dropped to them by mistake. These weapons are unbelievable, and ISIS has been armed to the teeth by all the weapons that come from the West. In a moment, my own perspective and a few predictions. Belgians have detained, not arrested, only detained one person in connection with last month's terrorist attacks in Paris. There's been very little progress that's been made public. The person detained was not the leader of the attacks. He's still at large. Belgium almost caught him last week. They knew where he was staying, but he escaped. You know why? You're not going to believe this. There is a law in Belgium which says it's against the law for the police to conduct a raid after 9 p.m. at night and before 5 a.m. in the morning. The leader discovered that the police were waiting for him, so he slipped out of the apartment where he'd been staying during the night. The law is in place so that the Belgian people are not disturbed by the police making noise at night. It's impolite and not urbane or cultured to have such activity at night. The laws of Belgium must be changed. Terrorists don't care about disturbing the quiet of the night. The police can't be limited by such ridiculous limitations. They need to find and capture not just this mastermind of this terrorist cell, but terrorists in general. Belgium should not be a safe haven for terrorists between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. A new poll was recently released. Surveys and polls work one of two ways. Either they surprise us or they confirm what we thought. The new poll, Surveying Palestinians, shows that Palestinian youth today are radicalized and they think that violence will justify their actions and will actually achieve their goals. This is a marked change. The survey also showed that the motivation for these actions is not religious but political. Those surveys say that the reason for their supporting violence and the reason for violence is to achieve their political objective. Finally, and this is the most telling of all, is that if there were an election tomorrow, if it were held tomorrow in the West Bank, Mahmoud Abbas, the current leader of Fatah, the president of the Palestinian Authority, would overwhelmingly lose by at least 10 percentage points to Ismail Khania, the leader of Hamas in Gaza. This is a damning blow to the establishment in the West Bank. And because more and more it's becoming radicalized, the people are becoming radicalized. This new study confirms our sense that young people are disenchanted with Abbas and Fatah, and that the West Bank youth are embracing violence as a tool to achieve their perspectives. That thinking poses a serious threat to a peaceful re resolution to any situation between the Palestinians and the Israelis. On another front, the U.S. Department of Transportation has ruled that Kuwaiti Airlines was in violation of U.S. law by not allowing an Israeli named Eldad Gat to travel on their airline from JFK, New York City, to Heathrow in London in 2013. Gott complained to the Department of Transportation. At first, they rejected his claim. He appealed, and the Department of Transportation found Kuwaiti Airlines in violation. Kuwaiti Airlines said that they were following their laws, which prohibit any business with Israelis or with Israel. The punishment for violating that law in Kuwait is very strict and includes imprisonment and hard labor. The Department of Transportation ruled that, quote, we consider Mr. Gott's claim upon an alternative ground, which holds that an air carrier or foreign air carrier may not subject a person, place, port, or type of traffic in foreign air transportation to unreasonable discrimination. The Department of Transportation said that the Kuwaiti laws do not outweigh the U.S. law against discrimination, where the destination permits Israelis to take off and land. Kuwait appealed the ruling on November 23rd. 
In response, Kuwait has simply shut down their New York City London route. It was very profitable, but they decided to close it down rather than lose the Department of Transportation case, which is now in appeal. Kuwaiti Air still flies from New York City to Kuwait, and Israelis are not permitted to purchase a ticket there. That does not violate U.S. law because Kuwait does not allow Israeli passport holders to enter their country. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Saudi Arabia is more than a country. It was founded in 1932 as a result of merging four regions after years of conquest by Abd al-Aziz al-Saud, also known as Ibn Saud. The official name in English of Saudi Arabia is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The English translation does not do justice to the Arabic. Arabia is a region. It's not a state, it's a region. Saudi Arabia means the Arabia that belongs to the House of Saud. In Arabic, the name al-Mamalaka al-Arabia al-Saudia, the word actually is clear in Arabic. It shows possession. Saudi Arabia means the area owned and ruled by the Saudi family. Those who do not recognize the Saudi rule call the area something else. Haramayin, they call it, which means the place of two holy sites, because Mecca and Medina are located there. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.